we are looking at God's use of parallels and patterns throughout the entire Bible so that we might understand the ways of God. Tonight, we're going to look at the temple of God, the sanctuary, and I want to show you that the ways of God are in his temple. The ways of God are in his temple. And the neatest thing about the Old Testament sanctuary service is that it really is a shadow of what goes on in heaven. Let's go with our first text to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. Paul talking about the priests downtown Jerusalem, Paul makes this statement. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. Parallel. Do you see the parallel? The priests downtown Jerusalem serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and the shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. The point in this verse again that I'm trying to hammer on this week is that God follows parallels and patterns. Now, last night after the seminar was over, the point was brought up, well, how is the flood in Noah's day similar to God's judgments in our day? Now, you can carry parallels and patterns beyond their intended meaning. Let me, let me reiterate what we were talking about. In Noah's case, how long did he preach before the flood came? 120, 120 years. And then he entered the ark and was there for seven days before it rained. And then the rain came and drowned everybody. And the Bible says, and they knew not. Well, it isn't that they didn't know that it hadn't been predicted, but it came in such a way that they didn't anticipate, is what the Bible's trying to say. You would think that all the animals getting on the ark would have been a clue. Clue? Animals mysteriously come in two by two and by sevens, gathering in the ark. Hmm, this is very interesting. Nobody paid it any attention. Now, the point that I'm, that I'm leading up to is that in our day, there is no warning. There is no 120-year warning which the world in general and the world at large is aware of. If you go down out here on the street and ask John Doe driving by at the Exxon station, you ask him, are you aware of any impending doom that has been predicted to come up on the earth and be specific about it? He would say, perhaps, perhaps not. Because religion today is very divisive over what they expect and anticipate. Most Christians will admit there is a great tribulation coming, but they don't know what causes it. They don't know what is involved with it. They don't know how it comes. All they know is that there is one somewhere. In our case, the Bible says that there is going to be a period of time in which God's judgments will be sorely felt, and there will be for a period of 1260 days a great time of distress. There will be an even greater time of distress for 75 days called the seven last plagues, making the total 1,335 days in length. Now, in Noah's day, the warning came first and then the judgment. In our day, the judgments come and salvation can be found during the first phase 
of the judgment. In our day, we have a different world. We have 1.3 billion Muslims. This is the largest religious body in the world. 1.3 billion Muslims. There's about 1.2 billion Hindus. There's about 900 million or 0.9 billion Catholics in the world. There's about 0.3 billion Christians that are not Catholic. By that I mean Protestants, Anglicans, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, etc. And if you go down and, and itemize out the world's population by religion, and there are seven major religions, you'll find that it is not possible for all these people to talk to each other. You would not believe a Muslim if he came to you and tried to tell you that the will of God was X, Y, Z. That's foreign. It's different. A Hindu has nothing in common with the Muslim or the Catholic. They're antagonistic. The Jew has nothing in common with the Muslim. It, it just, we're just a world very fractured. So God, God understands our diversity. He is not distressed at all by our diversity. And so during the time period of the Great Tribulation, God sends such overwhelming judgments that every religious system, and there are seven, will recognize that God is angry. It won't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. The extremity of these judgments, the first judgment, as I, as I was discussing last night, is this earthquake and these phenomena, the earthquake that brings great destructive, the, all the water dams break open. Hydroelectric power, gone. Runways split. Airplanes grounded. Bridges fall in the river. Overpasses fall down. Tele te telephone lines are snapped. God is going to get the attention of the whole world. When I was a child, I saw on television a movie titled, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Anybody ever see that? You remember that? And how awesome this man came in a flying saucer and he came to tell the earth that unless it stopped being so violent and so mean that God was going to take care of it. In, in this case, it wasn't the God of heaven, but a higher force. And so they, at, at 12 o'clock one day, all the electricity in the whole world goes off. And he's stuck on an elevator. Remember that? When the, ele when the electricity goes off? The, the point is, is that this higher being was trying to tell earthlings that so enough's enough. When God sends the first trumpet, it will be fire. I spelled that wrong. How do you spell fiery? F-I-E-R-Y, right? Fiery hailstorm. It burns up one-third of the earth. That's the first trumpet. The second trumpet is a great asteroid impact that will hit the sea. And the tsunami that results from this impact will wash away coastal cities all around. If it hits the Pacific, the Hawaiian Islands are gone, Japan is gone, and there will be beachfront property in Colorado. Do you know it's that scientists have done some modeling. If an asteroid were to hit the Gulf of Mexico, the tidal wave coming up through Texas would reach all the way to Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, an asteroid of only um, one mile in diameter 
would create a tidal wave of that, of that size. And remember, the tidal wave radiates. So what would that mean to Mexico? What would that mean to South America? What does that mean to the coastal cities? Well, let me show you a text that I think is very, uh, very important with respect to this. Luke chapter 21, verse 25, Jesus said, There will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars on earth. Watch this. Plural. See the little s on nations? Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at what? The roaring and tossing of the sea. What causes this roaring and tossing of the sea that perplexes all the nations? Nations all around, I use the Pacific as a target because it's the largest body of water among the seven oceans. What is, what, what's the point here? What's causing the sea to be so violent? Nations in anguish and perplexity. I think it's the asteroid impact. Nothing else sinks a third of the ships. The Bible says that this will th sink a third of the ships, and all the sea creatures die. Of course, we've been interpreting that for years as a general hurricane, haven't we? I don't think that uh, uh, what Jesus is talking about here, when you look at all the context of his discussion, that it is over a 2,000 year period. I think he's talking specifically about a time when there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars at a time that marks the, the birth of a new kingdom, a birth of a new order, the second coming. The third trumpet that will get the world's attention is an asteroid impact on land. On a continent. The Bible doesn't tell us which continent. But it says, the Bible does tell us, that it causes the water to become poisonous. And many people drink the water and die. Many people drink the water. The water this is called wormwood because the word for wormwood means poisonous. And you can find this in Jeremiah and other places in the Bible. And how you say, well, how does an asteroid impact cause the water to become poisonous? Well, it's quite simple. Here's, a, here's some land, and we're looking at the side, and this is the strata of Earth. You know, Earth is laid down in sedimentary layers. And when you have a great impact, the, the impact creates fissures. It breaks up the Earth. This causes the leaching fields to change. And the great aquifers, let's just take the Edwards as an example. Some of you drink out of the Edwards, do you? The Edwards aquifer, if the strata above it is significantly broken up, all the sewage, all the toxic waste that's buried in the earth, all the, the bacteria that has been in the, put in the landfills, the sanitary landfills, simply leach down into the aquifers. People drink the water that's become poisonous and die. How fast does typhus and typhoid travel? What happened in Mozambique just last fall with the flooding? How fast did typhus take over in a heartbeat? It only takes a couple of chickens to ruin a whole aquifer. A few hogs in North Carolina, remember that? Remember all those dead hogs? The fourth trumpet will be volcano eruptions. Now, the Bible doesn't say volcano eruptions. The Bible says there will be darkness a third of the day and a third of the night are without light. The way I understand this is after these events, these two asteroid impacts have changed the geological strata of Earth, the ring of fire cuts loose. You know, the ring of fire is, is a ring of about 4,000 volcanoes, many of which are inactive at the present time. On Earth right now, I believe they say that there's only about 400 active volcanoes. 
But there are about 4,000 known volcanoes, many of them inactive. But you say, well, how does a third of the day and a third of the night go without light? Well, here's Earth. I'm going to divide. One of these lines is called the Tropic of Cancer, and the other is the Tropic of Capricorn. And it's the division of Earth by thirds, the, par the parallels, the long latitudinal parallels. And guess where most people live? In which third of the Earth? <laughs> the middle third. Very good. I believe that what John is describing when he says a third of the day and a third of the night is without light, the way it's represented to him in vision is that he sees this third obscured from light because the jet stream carries the ejecta and debris around the center of the earth. This prevents crops from growing. Darkness will cover the earth. There will be a long and extended period of darkness. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation 11 that during this 1260 days, there will be no rain. Just like in Elijah's time. Zero. No rain. So if you think Texas is dry right now, you can understand the severity of these judgments. And that's what I want you to understand, that God is going to affect the entire world and he's going to have the full attention of the Muslims, the Jews, the Hindus, the Catholics, the Protestants, you name it. God is going to gain the attention of everyone and everyone will conclude the same thing. Surprisingly, that God or Allah or Jehovah or whatever he's called is angry. And what must be done then to appease him? Well, this appeasing of God will occur in different ways. In Muslim countries, the day of worship is Friday. Friday will become exalted as, as the holy day of Allah. And 1.3 billion Muslims will be compelled to honor Allah. Muslims worship on Friday because that's the day Mohammed rested in his escape to Mecca. About 35 million Jews and a equivalent number of Christians, so about 70 million, which would be 0.07 billion, <laughs> worship on Saturday. And in Israel, where Sabbath, Saturday, is the day of worship, Saturday laws will be implemented. When you add up the Roman Catholic Church and all Protestants, you get about 1.2 billion people that worship on Sunday. And in countries where Catholic and Protestant government, uh, people are in the majority, you will see Sunday laws as a means of appeasing the wrath of God. There will be a host of sinless laws implemented in every nation to appease God, to cause His wrath to cease. I'm talking about a religious revolution that has no equal ever on the face of earth. When the Antichrist gets here, it is my personal conviction, that he's going to set up a day of worship for all people when he establishes and when he eliminates and reduces all religions into one religion, Antichrist, the devil, is going to set up, perhaps he's going to choose a Wednesday as the day of worship so as not to favor any one religion particularly. That way the Muslims won't be complaining 
about the Christians and the Jews won't be complaining about the Muslim. So the devil just chooses a day which obviously is going to stand in contest to God's holy day which is Sabbath. Saturday. And the contest will be very clear, very distinct, and very well understood by all religions. All religions. Even though all religions right now are antagonistic, that will not always be the case. Okay, so that you know that, just consider it anyway. Let me go back now. I want to show you something about the wrath of God as it relates to coming events. We read in Hebrews chapter 8 that the priests downtown Jerusalem serve in a temple that is a copy or a parallel of what is in heaven. You recall that the courtyard is this outer line and this is the holy place and this is the most holy place and this is a pool of water, laver, bucket of water and this is the altar of burnt offering. Now, I explained this past Sabbath about how the sinner came and he stood right here in front of the altar of burnt offering and he put his lamb, his sacrifice on the altar and he confessed the sins of his family. And they are standing out here when their time for the service has come. And then the priest hands him the knife and the patriarch representing the family cuts the jugular vein of the lamb and the lamb's blood is caught in a little cup and then with a branch of hyssop the priest who is standing here puts blood on the horns of the altar. Everybody remember that? Okay. This is called the altar of burnt offering. Because this is where the offerings are burnt and sin is transferred away from the sinners to the sanctuary by the vehicle of blood. And this altar serves for individuals. What, I, what do I mean by individuals? I mean that the altar burnt offering is dedicated for the use of ordinary people, individuals. Inside this room is another altar. It's called the altar of incense and it has horns on it too. This altar serves the corporate need of Israel, whereas the altar of burnt offering serves for individuals. Let me talk about the altar of incense and how that this is for, well, let's see, I'll just write it right there. This is a corporate offering. Let me explain this. Every morning and every evening, the priests took a lamb, put it on this altar, killed it, and carried its blood into the, most, into the holy place and put its blood on the horns of this altar twice a day. Sunrise, sunset. Sunset, sunrise. And this service going on con continually became known as the daily, the daily sacrifice because it happened twice a day morning and evening, evening and morning. Now this offering, several things stand out in contrast to this offering as opposed to this offering. The daily offering is provided for by the priests. Indiv individuals do not bring their lamb 
and it serve as this sacrifice. That's the first point. Number two, the daily offering is for no one in particular, but for everyone in general. Corporate. It's a corporate offering. Well, why do we need a corporate offering? Simple. Let's suppose, David, you belong to the tribe of um, Benjamin. Okay? And let's suppose that the tribe of Benjamin have their turn at the altar in the month of June. How are the sins for all the Benjamites covered until June gets here? Only one way. Through the corporate offering. In other words, let me say this very carefully. By putting the sacrifice on this altar day and night, God is covering for the whole camp so that he can dwell in their presence. And even though they have sinned, they have an atonement waiting, covering them until they can get to the altar with their own sacrifice. God has forgiven you before you even sin. That's a fact. The Bible says, while we were still enemies, what did he do? He reconciled us to himself. While we were still his enemy. This altar, altar of incense, is a not is a golden altar. This altar is a higher level of service than the bronze that covers this altar. This is gold, this is bronze. The service at this altar is much more encompassing, much more, much larger in its scope than this one. Now, Dave, you come, let's say it's the month of June, and you come and you and your family, you stand here, and you offer your lamb, and your sins are transferred away from you, and blood is put on the horns of the altar, and when this occurs, you are free, you are set free of all guilt. Your guilt has been transferred away from you to the sanctuary. And the record of that guilt is in blood on the horns. And you and your family, you can go back home knowing that your sins have been forgiven. Now, June 2. That was June 1. Guess what happens on June 2? He sins. <laughs> and then June 3. But your turn to get back to the altar just because of the practical ramifications here, is not for another year. God makes atonement for you until you can get there. God is providing the atonement until we come to the cross. Because you see what's really neat about this, do you remember that on the north side of the sanctuary there's the table of showbread up there? And down here are the seven candlesticks down here. And inside here is the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that? Well, God did this in such a way, he laid it out so that when you come and stand right here with your altar, you are standing at the foot of the cross. And until you can get to the cross, some of us are older when we come to the cross and finally find Jesus as our Savior. And all those years, God has made and provided an, a, a way. His wrath or his wrath would have destroyed us all long ago. By providing the continual atonement, God could dwell in the camp of Israel day and night. 
there was a constant atonement being made for the whole camp of Israel. On the Day of Atonement, the time had come to cling the altar, the altars, plural, and the most holy place. Let me explain this for a second. I made such a mess, I'll start over. Here is the, there's the furniture. Here's the altar of incense. On the Day of Atonement, there's a three-step process to cleansing the sanctuary. The first step is that that morning on the Day of Atonement, tenth day, seventh month, the high priest comes and he stands over here and he puts up onto the altar a bull, a big bull, a big bull, a cow. And he offers what is considered the most expensive sacrifice that can be offered, a bull. Then he takes some of the blood. He comes around and he stands over here now. He takes some of the blood and he goes. He stops by here and washes his hands and his feet. He comes through here and he comes around here and he stands right here in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And the high priest <clears throat> is carrying a censer that's uh, filled with coals of fire and there's incense on it. And he comes into the most holy place with this censer and this cup of blood because he is about to stand in God's presence. And if God does not accept him, and this atonement, this blood and the incense, does not predispose God to accept him, the high priest will be struck dead. That's why he's wearing on his garment pomegranates and bells. They can hear him moving. And so as he comes in, he is approaching God, and he wants God to approve him and find him worthy to officiate on behalf of the camp of Israel. Let me say that again. Before the high priest can cleanse the sanctuary, he's got to be found worthy to do so. He comes with the, the blood of a bull, comes in here, and after God accepts his atonement, his sacrifice, his sins are forgiven, his life is spotless. Then the high priest leaves, comes out, goes back out here into the courtyard. Let me clean up a few of this, this a little bit. Now then, there are two goats out here waiting in the courtyard. Lots are cast. One lot falls on the Lord's chosen, or the selected goat. These two goats represent Michael and Lucifer. These two goats represent two angels who were once best friends. These two goats represent, and goats are used because the idea of between the difference between a sheep and a goat is independence. A goat is a very independent animal. Will go in any direction he chooses. A sheep is a follower. Lucifer, independent of God, chose to sin. He becomes the scapegoat. The other goat becomes the goat of atonement. Lots are cast, and the Lord's goat is selected. The Lord's goat is put on the altar of burnt offering. Then the blood is carried in, just like before, and he stands here before God, the high priest, this time representing Israel, the people. He's not representing himself. He's representing Israel. When the Lord accepts the, the atonement and says yes I know that the camp I know that everybody in camp has been has made things right I know that everybody 
is ready to be at one mint with me. Then the high priest begins the cleansing process of the temple. What he's going to do is he's going to remove all the sin out that's been collected for a whole year here and put it on the head of the scapegoat which will be led out to the wilderness to die. So the high priest comes out of here. But first, excuse me. After the Lord has said he accepts the atonement, the high priest sprinkles blood on the Ark of the Covenant. That's the first thing that gets cleaned, cleansed. The Ark of, of, of the Covenant has been, the, God's law has been violated, and the high priest sprinkles blood on the Ark, on the mercy seat, to make atonement for the law of God. The second thing that gets cleaned on the way out is the altar of incense. And the priest takes some of the blood. He goes over here and he sprinkles blood on the horns of the altar of incense. And, it's the, and the altar is made clean by blood. Restored by blood. It, the, the blood is not washed off. He puts fresh blood on there. And then with his hands, he cleans off the, the old blood. He reconstitutes the blood. And the new blood cleanses the altar. Then he comes out here and he cleanses the last item is the altar of burnt offering. After he has put blood, new fresh blood on the horns, he then cleanses the horns and with his bloody hands he goes then over to the scapegoat, wipes his hands on the head of the scapegoat, the record of sin being transferred, and then the scapegoat is led out into the wilderness to die a very painfully slow death showing that the consequences of sin will be repaid 100%. This goat paid for the penalty of sin. This goat pays for the consequences of sin. Restitution is always required in God's order. This is the restitution. This is the penalty. Now, several things I need to... to um, pick up on here. Let me clean this up a little bit. Does everybody pretty much understand this? Uh, perhaps you've seen most of this before. The first thing I want to show you is, is neat. Here's the altar of incense. Here's the altar of burnt offering. And here is the Ten Commandments. Remember how they were laid out? And remember the order in which they are cleansed? The first point I want to make is that in Revelation chapter 8, when the censer is cast down in verse 5, remember, just as the trumpets are about to sound, what does that tell you about the timing of where we are in the cleansing process. I believe the Bible indicates that there are three very important events in the cleansing of heaven's temple. We've already established that there is a temple in heaven and the one on earth is a parallel to the one in heaven. We know that the altar of incense is a corporate altar. I'll show you that again in just a second. We're going to go to Le Leviticus 4, and this is for individuals. And the Ark of the Covenant here, of course, contains God's law. For right now, we have about five minutes. Good. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 4, and let's notice some of the text. Watch this. Moses, the Lord says, say to the Israelites, when anyone sins unintentionally and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, if the anointed priest sins, bring, bringing guilt on the people, he must bring, excuse me, he must bring to the Lord a young bull without defect as a sin offering for the sin he has committed. He is to present the bull at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord. 
he is to lay its hand, his hand upon its head and slaughter it before the Lord. Then the anointed priest, that is the high priest, shall take some of the bull's blood and carry it into the tent of meeting. Now, who are we talking about? If, if who sins? Let's go back to verse 2 real quick, or 3. If who sins? Okay. We're going to see four groups of people to prove a very interesting point. So when the anointed priest sins, where, which one of these altars does his blood land on? His, his sacrifice is blood. The one inside the tent. Right? So if the high priest sins, his sacrifice has got to go on this altar. Okay? Now watch this. He is to dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle some of it seven times before the Lord in front of the curtain of the sanctuary. What is in front of the curtain? The altar of incense. Okay. Then the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense that is before the Lord. Okay, everybody's with me on that. Then we go down a few verses. Let me jump down here to verse 13. Watch this. If the whole Israelite community sins unintentionally. Now we're talking again about a corporate body. If the whole camp sins unintentionally and does what is forbidden in any of the Lord's commands, even though the community is unaware of the matter, they are guilty. When they become aware of the sin they committed, the assembly must bring a young bull as a sin offering and present it before the tent of meeting. The elders of the community are to lay their hands on the, bull, the bull's head before the Lord, and the bull shall be slaughtered before the Lord. Then the anointed priest, or the high priest, is to take some of the bull's blood where? Where is he going with this blood? He's going inside to this altar, as you'll see. He'll dip his finger into the blood and sprinkle it before the Lord seven times in front of the curtain, and he's to put some of the blood on the horns of the altar, that is, before the Lord, in the tent of meeting. See that? The rest of the blood he shall pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering. This is important. I haven't mentioned this, I don't think. But at the base of the altar of burnt offering, there is a bucket. And all the extra blood that's not used is poured into this bucket. The reason this is important is because in Revelation chapter 6, John says that he saw the souls of those who had been slain for their word of God and the testimony they maintained. And where are they located in Revelation 6? Under the altar. And you know what's kept under the altar? The blood of sacrifices. When the Lord said that Abel's blood cried out to him from the ground, what does he mean? The shedding of blood calls for vengeance. Life for life. These are the martyrs. This is where the altar burnt offering is seen in heaven's temple in Revelation 6. This is where the altar of incense is seen in Revelation 8. We're going to see all the furniture there, the Ark of the Covenant included, the candlesticks. It's all there in heaven. And understanding the process of cleansing and how we, we work our way out. Well, we're going to take an intermission here for five minutes and then we'll resume.